back to eighth grade social studies. This is our last week together, and we've got some pretty exciting things to talk about today. So let's start right, we'll just get right to it. Um, the first thing that we're going to talk about today is going to be the Renaissance. This is going to be a rebirth of Europe. And then we're going to talk about the Reformation. The key word there is reform. So we're going to look at the reform of the Catholic Church, which as we've talked about over the last few weeks, has been the power structure of Europe. So we're going to see how Europe is going to change during two very prominent time periods, the Renaissance and the Reformation. So let's start with a little bit of background about where we were. We were talking about in the previous weeks, the darkness that had overtaken Europe. Well, the Renaissance is going to be out of that darkness. We're going to come out of that darkness. We're going to leave behind the horrors of the Black Death, and we're going to see cities that are going to become centers of trade and economic growth. And we're going to see that Europeans are going to start worrying more about life and the good things in life instead of worrying about death all of the time. So this is going to be a rebirth of Europe. Even warfare is going to lead to intellectual type innovations that are going to occur in Europe. So the desire for change, whoops, we kind of went here. Okay, the desire for change, what we're going to see is people are going to be looking at things like art, literature, learning, increased exploration because we're going to take these ideas and we're going to spread them all over the world. And then we're going to look at trade in faraway lands, trading our goods and becoming more of a worldwide na a community of nations instead of just one particular nation. And all of this is going to occur starting in Europe. Good, it's hard to think of good coming out of bad, but good did come out of the Black Death. You had a lot of people that died, and unfortunately for them, that's not a very good thing. And of course, people were very sad about that. But when you have a lot of people dying, what's also going to happen, this isn't going to damage buildings and farmland and machines and gold. All the riches are going to be there. And guess what? Now they can be divided amongst more people. Kind of a cruel way to look at it, but that's reality. That's what's going to happen after the Black Death. There's going to be more wealth to go around. People can start demanding higher wages. There's going to be more money that can be spent. Well, what are they going to spend that money on? Now people are, like I say, not so worried about death and dying all the time. And warfare is not going to be the, the major talk of the day. Now people are going to say, what can we do with this spare time and with this extra money that we have? So Europe's economy is going to start to grow. Trade is going to increase. People are going to start looking at other ways to occupy their time. So what is the Renaissance? Renaissance actually means rebirth. That is the meaning of the word Renaissance. And it is a fervent period of, of people learning how to do new ta have new talents and painting and sculpting and all these beautiful things that are going to come out of this time period. And it's generally described as a time period that happened between the 14th century all the way to the 17th century. So we're talking about quite a number of years here. But it's going to be the rediscovery of classical philosophy. They're even going to go back and get things from the Greeks and the Romans, and they're going to bring them back, and they're going to start studying those things again. Literature and art are going to become very important to the people. So what did the Renaissance actually give to the world? Well, it actually gave the world some of the greatest thinkers and authors and statesmen. You're going to have great scientists that are going to come out of this time period. And global exploration. We're going to see a new time of people coming from Europe and going all over the rest of the world looking for new adventures, looking for new lands. That's going to be a very interesting time period. And it's going to bridge the gap between the Middle Ages and what we think of as modern times. That is going to be this period known as the Renaissance. Now you might ask yourself, where did it actually start? The Renaissance, if you trace back the real beginnings of the Renaissance time period, it's going to primarily happen in Italy. There are four primary cities that it's going to occur in. They are Genoa, Milan, Venice, and Florence, Italy. So this is where the great renaissance is going to happen. It's going to be in Italy. The first city is going to be Genoa. Genoa is going to be 
uh, trade. They're going to trade wine and olive oil. They're going to have, you know, a great uh, p place where they are on the water and they're going to have lots of ships that they can send out to trade these goods with other places. Christopher Columbus is actually from Genoa. So that's an interesting tidbit. Milan. Now you've probably heard of Milan, Fashion Week, all that stuff that goes on. Milan has always been a great center of creativity. And that is, is still true today, that Milan is a great center of creativity. Another thing that came out of Milan was great architecture, beautiful buildings that you can see here. And some of those greatest uh, artists came from there. Leonardo da Vinci was actually born in Milan. Venice, one of the great, most beautiful places uh, in the world, probably most known for its canals and the gondolas that go along because it is built on a series of islands and they have to build bridges and, and canals in order to get from one place to another. So if you go to Venice today, you would see that. And of course, the gondolas are, are going to take you from place to place. It's really, and I'm going to give you a tidbit since we are talking about uh, modern times, they say that now since the epidemic and they've had to close down most of Italy, that these canals are usually very dark and you can't see the water. Since all of the gondolas and the people have not been on the canals, the water's actually clear. Isn't that an interesting fact? Something that's happened since the coronavirus started and Italy was closed down. But let's get back to our history. Military power, naval ships is going to be a big thing in Milan. They're actually going to have not only their gondolas for getting from place to place within uh, Venice, they're also going to have great ships called galleys. These are huge warships, and that made them very prominent as well. One of the most famous people from Venice is going to be Marco Polo. And then last but not least, the city I want to mention today is the city of Florence. Now, Florence is going to be the biggest, largest, most prominent Italian city that the Renaissance is going to come out of. And one of the greatest things that's going to come out of Florence is going to be the banking industry. Banking is going to be very, very important during this particular time because this power, whoever controls the money, controls the power. And so the banking industry is going to start up in Florence, Italy, and it's going, going to become very prominent within Italy. One of the greatest banking families from Italy is going to be the Medici family. The Medici family is the most powerful banking family of Florence. And they are all, another thing that's going to come out of Florence is a very diverse kind of society. You're going to have rich, middle class, poor, and all of these people are going to blend together, bring their talents together, and make a very flourishing city. They're going to have something called guilds where people are going to be trained as apprentices. They're going to learn new jobs. They're going to learn new skills. But they're also going to be fairly represented and they're going to be able to demand good wages. And all of those things are going to be helped out by the creation of the guilds. Two of the big industries that are going to come out of this are the wool industry and the silk industry. So let's go back to talking about those great families. It's going to be interesting that in these particular cities, particularly in Florence, you're going to have great families that are going to arise. Those are going to be the Albizzi family, the Pazzi family, the Borgia family, and like I said before, the Medici family. The Medici family is going to be very, very powerful. Actually, if they, if there's a new research item. Again, I always like to bring you modern facts to, to show why we study ancient history. There's a modern research uh, by Italian economists that points out this extraordinary fact. The wealthiest families in Florence today are actually descended from these great families of the Renaissance. So that's an interesting fact that the money kind of stayed with the money. So that, that might be something that you might be interested in. Now, let's go back to talking about the Medici family. The Medici family has been nicknamed the godfathers of the Renaissance. So if you know what a godfather, if you're talking about, it's almost like the modern day mafia. And if you talk about the Italian mafia in the United States, again, they trace back some of their lineage to, again, who controls the money? Who controls what's going on in society? Well, the Italians are really big with that. 
And so they were known as the godfathers of the Renaissance. They were not nobility. That's an interesting thing. The Medici did not start out as a wealthy family. Now, they were in the patrician class, which was kind of the middle to upper class, but they were not noblemen. But what they were was very smart. As a matter of fact, Giovanni de' Medici founded the Medici Bank in about 1397, and it was the beginning of a family heirloom or a family era that's going to last for many, many generations. Cosimo de' Medici is going to in inherit the Medici Bank in about 1429, and it's going to begin his rise to power. And then his son is Lorenzo. Lorenzo is going to be known as Lorenzo the Magnificent because of all the great things that he's going to bring to the society of Florence. Now, one of the things that they are going to do is they are going to be the chief bankers of the Roman Catholic Church. Here we go, back to that power of the Roman Catholic Church. The Roman Catholic Church has a lot of money. Now, you wouldn't think that, you know, the church should be so concerned about money. But whichever banker could have the church's money was a very powerful bank. And that was one of the greatest things that the Medici family did, is they acquired the power over the money of the Catholic Church. Now you might ask yourself, what are they going to do with all of this money? Well, this is going to be a time when people, remember, they don't have movies and television and all of that. So their entertainment is art. We're talking about literature, uh, maybe even plays, but we're mainly talking about sculpture and paintings and all these great things that are going to be created. And people are fascinated with those things. So the great artists of the time are going to need money in order to perform their task or to perform their art. Well, they get this money from great families like the Medici family and other families are going to compete for the great artists. You want to be a patron of the greatest artists. That's where you're, what you're trying to do at this particular time. So the Medici family is going to become patrons of artists. Now, they're going to become patrons of, patrons of some great artists. Ones that you're going to recognize, Leonardo da Vinci and Michelangelo. So let's talk about Mike Leonardo da Vinci first. Well, actually, let's go talk a little a few, a few more facts about the Medici's. They are seen as friends of the common people. They take care of their common people, um, and they, they, they actually socialize with the common people, and that's something that was very unusual for wealthy people to do at this time. They had great political influence, and they also amassed a large library. That was very important. So now let's go to the Gutenberg Press. We're going to talk about how did this information get out to people. The printing press was a very interesting device. It was actually created for the very first time in China, but it was done with wooden blocks. And then Johannes Gutenberg is going to be the man that is going to finally create a device where they could mass produce pamphlets and papers and books. The main book that he's going to create is going to be the Gutenberg Bible. Now that's important because you have to understand the church, when you went to church, the whole church was done in a foreign language that you did not understand. Finally, they're going to print the Bible in the vernacular, which is a language that the people could read. Well, Gutenberg is going to be one of the first ones to mass print this Bible. And the Bible that he is going to use, the first one he's going to print, is going to be 300 separate molded blocks and 50,000 sheets of paper in order to make this Gutenberg Bible. Now, the interesting fact that you might want to know is that you can still find fragments of this Bible, but there are also 21 complete copies of the Gutenberg Bible that were printed at this particular time, and you can find them in different museums all over the world. There's actually one of them in Washington, D.C. Now, let, now we're going to talk about the famous people of the Renaissance. I got a little ahead of myself just a moment ago and forgot to tell you about the Gutenberg Press. But famous people of the Renaissance. Here we are. 
Leonardo da Vinci, probably one of the most famous artists of all time, probably one of the most well-known artists. When you say the name Leonardo da Vinci, there are very few people that haven't heard that. He painted the Mona Lisa and the Last Supper. Another thing that he was known for is he constantly had a sketch pad in his hand. He was always drawing things, always inventing things and coming up with great things like flying machines, very, very interesting man, created things long before his time. One of his greatest paintings is, of course, The Last Supper. If you've ever seen the movie The Da Vinci Code, they talk a lot about that painting and the meanings behind that painting. Not that the things in that movie are necessarily factual, but it is very interesting to examine this particular painting of The Last Supper, which captures the drama of the moment that Jesus is having the Last Supper with his disciples, and he's telling them, one of you is going to betray me. So that's the moment that's being captured in this particular painting. Another of one of his most famous, probably the most famous painting in the whole world is the Mona Lisa. Interesting thing about the Mona Lisa, nobody knows who he actually painted. Lots of rumors, who, who was it? Who was this girl? And then there are even some rumors that maybe it wasn't even a girl. They said that maybe the subject was one of his longtime apprentices that he dressed up like a woman and painted them. But you know what? Da Vinci is the only one who knows, except for the person who sat for the painting. And guess what? Neither one of them told us who this is. So we really don't know who Mona Lisa is, but it is the most prominent painting in the world. And then we've got other people, Raphael. Raphael is going to be known for his painting of the Madonna and also the School of Athens. Then we're going to have another very famous man, Michelangelo, probably the second, second to Leonardo da Vinci as the most well-known name. But he is most famous for his iconic statue of David, which actually became the symbol of Florence. And another thing he's known for is painting the Sistine Chapel. This You can't see it in very much detail, but I encourage you to go look at it. This is an entire ceiling and walls, and he painted all of that by himself and laying on his back up on scaffolding. So that's a very, very interesting thing is the Sistine Chapel. Donatello was a great sculptor. Again, David was a prominent uh, person that people like to depict in their art. Two of his most famous statues are two statues of David. This particular one, actually it was uh, rumored that the queen came from Spain and she was she could not stand that statue so much that she asked them to please cover it up during her visit to Europe. So that was a very interesting tidbit of fact. But he was very good at doing lifelike, if you see this beautiful sculpture of a little boy. So he did lots of lifelike um, sculptures. Uh, now we're going to look at Niccolo Machiavelli. I guarantee you when you get to high school, you're going to hear about a book called The Prince. They said that, the, that a political leader should always be virtuous and act virtuously for virtue's sake because he needed to be a good example for the people. But you'll read a lot about The Prince. It's a very, some people say controversial book. Some people say it's a very enlightening book. But I'm sure you'll hear about The Prince at some point in your academic career. Um, now we're going to look at two scientists that were very prominent during this time. We've got Copernicus. Um, who is going to be the first one to say that the earth was not the center of the universe, that the sun was the center of the universe. Another person that's going to continue with that theory is a man called Galileo. Galileo is going to do lots of pioneering work with telescopes. Now the interesting thing about Galileo and Copernicus is they're not going to be liked by the church. As a matter of fact, the church is going to excommunicate Galileo because they said his theory did not go along with church teachings. Chaucer, The Canterbury Tales, another uh, book that you'll probably read at some point. The next one is Dante, Dante's Inferno, the story and the painting that goes along with a trip to hell where you've got all these different layers of, of you know, evil that are going to occur. Very, very interesting. I, I recommend that you go back and study something about the Divine Comedy and Dante's Inferno. And then, of course, who hasn't heard of Shakespeare, the greatest playwright of all time. Not sure if he wrote all of his plays, but he certainly got credit for them. 
Botticelli, an Italian painter, uh, he painted the Adoration of the Magi and probably the Birth of Venus is his most famous painting. Now the last thing that I want to have time for us to discuss, to discuss today, because we could spend all day on art and artists, is I want us to talk about the reformation of the church. Remember the church is extremely powerful, but there's going to come a time when the people are going to get tired of what the church is telling them and they're not going to quite believe everything that the church is saying. So something's going to happen called the Reformation. And it's actually going to be triggered by a man that is uh, named Martin Luther. Martin Luther is going to write down 95 things that he felt was wrong with the church. The primary thing that he felt was wrong with the church was they were selling indulgences. They were selling tickets to heaven. And he's like, "There's no, that's not right. The church is not doing what the Bible says because he was a prominent theologian and he studied closely the word of the Bible. As a matter of fact, he wanted the Bible translated so that people could actually read it themselves and not listen to just what the church was saying. But he actually is rumored to have nailed 95 rules that he wanted the church to follow, 95 things that he felt the church was doing wrong, and he wanted to change this. So he started a movement called the Reformation, the reforming of the church. He's actually going to be excommunicated from the church because of this. Not, not a surprise, is it? Um, the word Protestant comes from protest. We have Protestant churches today that came out of this movement. Uh, humanism was another form where it said that humans should have more control over their religious beliefs. And so that is another very interesting fact. One of the greatest humanists was Erasmus. And we're going to go real quickly to a man named John Calvin who believed in something called predestination, that God had chosen everyone that was going to be saved, and he was another Protestant reformist. Another unusual one is a man named Henry VIII. Now, Henry VIII was a king. He was not necessarily a religious man, but because he wanted to divorce his wife and the church would not allow him to, he just started his own church called the Anglican Church. And he ended up actually beheading a couple of his wives. So I'm not sure religion was his primary focus there, but who knows. And then we're going to last but not least look at the explorers of this particular time. This was the age of discovery. This was when the world was being discovered by the Europeans. Now it's not saying that people weren't already in the places that they were going. It's the Europeans going there. It's the European age of exploration. You've got Ferdinand Magellan, who is going to be a Spanish, uh, a Portuguese explorer, who is going to make the journey to um, gain land for Spain. And then, of course, the most famous one we know is Christopher Columbus, who sailed the ocean blue in 1492. Lots of controversy about Christopher Columbus. Was he a good man? Was he a bad man? You have to make that determination on your own. It's according to what version of the history that you look at. But Christopher Columbus is probably the most famous explorer that we know about. And then there's Ponce de Leon, who is going to discover Puerto Rico, and he is going to uh, search for the Fountain of Youth. Lots of legendary stories about Ponce de Leon. Vasco Nunez de Balboa was another Spanish conquistador who is going to go out and claim the ocean and all of its shores for Spain. That was his goal. And his achievement and ambition actually posed a threat to one of the Spanish governors, and he was accused of treason. So that's a very interesting story, too, that I wish I had time to go into. But again, Balboa, very interesting. And then we have De Soto. Hernando de Soto, a 16th century Spanish explorer who is going to travel nearly 4,000 miles throughout the southeastern United States, and that's going to be Florida and all those things that he is going to discover. Now, lots of things were happening during the Renaissance and the Reformation, and I sped through all of that really, really quickly, and I hate that we couldn't spend more time talking in detail, but I just wanted to hit the highlights for you. And I encourage you to go back and rewatch this again when they put it on YouTube so that you can go back and pick some of these topics that we've talked about for the last six weeks. Do a little more research, find out about them, find out how they affect today and what's going on in today's world. I've truly enjoyed the last six weeks and I truly hope that you go back and find out more about the topics that we've talked about. Have a great summer. And I hope to see you guys come the fall. Thank you.